sure many of you will be affected by this this morning. A second day of rail strikes is underway, causing chaos up and down the country after talks between the RMT union and railway employers broke down yesterday. Well, the union is representing rail workers, including maintenance staff, cleaners and train guards. Train drivers are represented by a different union. We're joined now by RMT Union General Secretary Mick Lynch, who's at Euston Station. Good morning to you. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us this morning. So, second day of strikes. I mean, we don't seem to be any closer to agreement on this. It's, it's caused chaos, but nothing has been achieved. So, what, what's going to be the way forward? How are we going to resolve this? Well, you said that the talks were broken down. They haven't broken down. They were adjourned yesterday so that both parties could uh, take a pause and we'll be back in this morning with both parts of it, the train operating companies and Network Rail, to try and work out a constructive settlement. What well, something's been achieved. We've shown that our members are determined to take action to get a reasonable deal from these employers and try and get a reasonable deal from an unreasonable government. So that's the situation we're in. Our members have given us a mandate to negotiate on the back of a very strong showing of industrial action and a very strong showing on the picket line here. And we're getting loads and loads of support from the public and even from the travellers who use our services. And it's essential now that we get an agreement and the government facilitates that agreement by allowing these companies to negotiate freely. Just remind us, Mr Lynch, what exactly is your demand? What is, what is it that you are looking for for your staff and your, your members of the union? Well, the companies are telling us they need to cut thousands and thousands of jobs. Network Rail have put a document in front of us that cuts out 2,900 track maintenance staff. They've also got rid of uh, nearly 2,000 managers, I believe, uh, and they want to cut more. The train operating companies have got an agenda that wants to cut thousands of our people from operating the trains. They also want to lower the salaries of people working on the railway and extend the working week, along with a whole number of other arrangements. So we're saying to them we can talk about change and what's been described as uh, modernisation, flexibility, the use of digital technology. We can discuss all of that, but it's got to be in the framework of no compulsory redundancies. So but... that people who wish to stay on the railway can be accommodated. We also need to get, work out those changes and get agreement on them. And we need a pay rise, because many of our people have not had a pay rise for two or three years now. The trouble is there's a lot of sort of, you know, claim and counterclaim as to the, the truth of all this, what's going on, because they've said that they haven't said about compulsory redundancies. They didn't say that in the letter that was put forward. Well, you can always rely on me to tell the truth, so just listen to me and you'll get the right answers. Yeah, so, but when uh, we spoke to Network Rail, they, they said... They, won't, they, they won't said be that compulsory. there wasn't... Well, when you put a notice, mentioned. Well, listen to me. When you put a letter... Well, there are compulsory men uh, redundancies mentioned. They gave us a letter under the Trade Union and Labour Relations Act saying there will be redundancies. The number they've put in front of us is 2,900. If there are going to be no compulsory redundancies, they can sign another letter, which is what our demand is, saying there won't be any. So if you ask somebody for a guarantee that there won't be any compulsory redundancies and they refuse to give you a guarantee... The conclusion that you might logically make is that they intend to make some compulsory Right, but the letter didn't actually mention compulsory redundancy. It's just so we're clear, because obviously there's been a lot of sort of toing and froing, a lot of people saying, you know, well, you're that, not telling the truth about not, that, they're not, not telling the, the truth about that. It's not, it's not really the way forward, is it, to reach an agreement? How close do you think well, you are now to, to getting agreement on this? So, for ten years, Network Rail used to give us a renewed letter, uh, along with the pay deal, that said there will be no compulsory redundancies. That's what we want them to do now. If they do that, we can then talk about the changes they want to make to work in practices and the other elements they've got. And then when we've uh, talked about those things, we can move on to the pay deal. And the pay deals are way behind inflation. And the offer they've given us at the moment is 2% and then a condition that we have to accept all of their changes when inflation today is 11.7%. So that's an inadequate offer, and our members haven't had a pay rise in the years running up to this. Just on that the train, train operators you... have got a very similar agenda, but different in detail. Uh, and we need to resolve that. OK. And well, that's what negotiations are for. Uh, just on that claim, we, we, we do have to give the de department's uh, response to your claim about they haven't had a pay rise for two to three years. They say, like other public sector workers, railway worker pay was subject to pay freeze during the pandemic. Unlike other public sector workers, railway workers have be seen above average pay increases over the last decade by approximately, they claim, 25%. Is that correct? 
Well, most of the pay deals that we've done have been in line with inflation rather than above them, but it, it's, it's deteriorating now. Inflation was at a, a, a low. Now, this idea that it's all relative, that because the RMT has done well in negotiations, we should give up our power to negotiate is a nonsense, because if we don't get a pay rise, they're not going to go and give it to some nurses or some doctors. They're just going to keep the money and make more profit. So what the companies in this industry need to do is realise that they've got to pay workers properly. And the proposals we've got in front of us now from the train operating companies is actually to pay people less, lower salaries than the salaries that are in existence at this time. So they're actually going to cut wages, not just against inflation, but against the salaries that exist in our industry today. And that is unacceptable for any trade union. I mean, looking ahead at this, you know, is Saturday's strike inevitable? Can it be averted at this stage? We also understand that plans are being drawn up for further strikes in a couple of weeks. What's, what's the future for this? Well, nothing is inevitable. There must be a settlement to this dispute. It's up to the companies when they want to make progress on that and how quickly they want to make it. If there's not a settlement, the disputes and the action will go ahead. We'll pause next week and think about what we've been told and we'll talk to our members and our officials and then we'll decide what the next stage of the campaign is and that will include industrial action and more strikes if we don't get a settlement to the dispute. OK. And what about the, the prospect of the law changing to allow employers to bring in temporary agency staff to cover for striking workers in future? That's what's set to go ahead as a consequence. Well, they cannot deploy agency staff onto the railway. This is safety critical work under legislation. So if you want somebody from an agency operating and controlling 25,000 volt distribution systems or signalling high speed trains or carry out, carrying out repairs in maintenance depots to high speed trains that go along at 140 miles an hour, that's a risk that Grant Shapps is going to have to make. Well, they said that they would make sure that health and safety staff, wasn't compromised. There's, there's a the shortage consequence, of labour in the country. Didn't they? They did, they did say they'd make sure health well, and safety wasn't compromised as a consequence of it. Well, how are they going to do that? It takes... To work on a high-speed train, you have to do a four-year apprenticeship and you have to have licensed tickets from the authorities to allow you to work on braking systems and high-voltage distribution systems. If they could go and find these people, they'd be all right, but they won't find them because they're not there. Uh, Mr Lynch, I have to say, this That's week... Uh, Mr Lynch, I know we're running out of time, but I have to say that this week, in just a few days, you have been described as a huge political voice, perhaps bigger than some of the political voices that we do have in this country. Uh, have you considered a career in politics? Could this be the next move for you after, these, after you've sorted what's going on at the RNT? Well, my job is to represent my members and get them a deal in this dispute, and I'm focused on that, and I'm aware that the press in this country, controlled by very rich people, will be looking to tarnish my reputation and other people involved in this dispute. That's what they're all about. That's why they follow me around. There's a cameraman here with me now that's been following me for a week. There's reporters from various outlets that follow me. They look in my bins, they knock on my neighbours' doors. So I'm very aware that pride comes before a fall. What we've got to do is get on with the job of negotiating an agreement and get our people under, back to work so they can operate the railway for the public. OK, Mick Lynch, thanks very much for joining us this morning. No doubt we will be speaking to you further in the uh, days and weeks ahead. Thanks for your time.